right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Swift Auditorium session, the KYC registry a year on. And I can imagine that for some of you, this will be a difficult, challenging session because it is the first one in the afternoon. And I'm convinced that some of you are still struggling from a jet lag, or at least use that one as an excuse to recover from the cocktails that you've had yesterday as well. So we are delighted to, to have you here. Welcome. Um, what are we going to do? Um, we are going to have a slightly interactive session. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just set the scene, and then we will basically uh, hear from two industry practitioners. We have Holly Johnson Stern from JP Morgan, and we have Mark Brotherton from Lloyd's, who will give their perspective on some of the KYC challenges that they're facing as a financial institution, uh, and, and how, they, how their experience with KYC registry has been. And then we will have uh, Guy Shepard, our market manager on the, on the Swift side, give you a bit of a better overview and insights into what the KYC registry is all about. And then we will go into a KY a show, which is Know Your Audience. So we are actually going to try out whether these are the real industry practitioners and whether he's the real market manager of, of the KYC registry. And so we will basically uh, inquire some of the challenges that you are facing as well. I hope all of you have received the audience voting panel. Anyone who didn't have it, who doesn't have it? All right. Seems good. So we will use that one uh, later on. OK, no, we're actually going to try it out already. So this is one of the first questions. So just for everyone to pick up the voting, uh, select it in the hand palm. So the first question, what is the type of institution you work for? And you can pick one solution. So you either just do that by just selecting the number and then we will basically look at the first results. So this is just a kind of a warm-up practice point. So turn on the voting, please. All right. That seemed to have gone well. Close to 60% of financial institutions, quite some vendor consultancy. I'm curious what the others are. Market infrastructure, that is one. Anyone else? <laughs> Stock exchange, Swift, <laughs> of course. I could have guessed. All right, second question. What is your job function? Here again, presuming that you only have one job that you execute at this very moment in time. Uh, please open the voting. Wow, 30% others. <laughs> clearly, we, clearly, we missed out on one category here. <laughs> so what is the others? Who voted others? And then you see no hands, of course. <laughs> Sorry? IT side, of course. Any others? Product development. Product development on the pay payment side. OK, investment services. All right, good. But you got, you got the trick. You know how it works. So that is well. So we actually can start with the session. SWIFT's financial crime compliance offering. So when my communications agent shared this with me for the first time, he said, this is the financial crime compliance hair dryer. And I thought he was uh, making a fool out of me, actually. Um, but no, this is actually. Uh, client transaction lifecycle, which goes all the way from the basic customer due diligence all the way through to the uh, ongoing due diligence. So it basically takes you through the various steps of your client onboarding cycle, the kind of KYC that you do. From there, you identify the risk profile, you do the due diligence. Once you feel comfortable in terms of setting up the relationship, you start transacting with the correspondent. And of course, at that moment in time, you will still do the ongoing monitoring. Now, what we believe at SWIFT and what is our vision is to 
um, build out those services and those solutions that are fulfilling the needs that you have as a financial industry throughout the entire client lifecycle. And this is also why SWIFT has put in quite a significant focus on its financial crime compliance offering. Not just KYC, which is the subject for today, but also other instruments such as sanction screening, sanctions testing and compliance analytics. So this is the session of today. We will take a closer look into what does this initial client onboarding looks like, what is the kind of information that you require, all the way through this ongoing uh, due diligence element. Of course, as part of uh, this CYBOS, there are other compliance um, and auditorium sessions as well that we'll be talking about the, the other kind of uh, steps. So we'll cover that one later on. I'm not going to spend too much time on the challenges because uh, in the various discussions that we've had with most of you, I think everyone today knows what uh, challenges that the regulatory landscape is imposing um, in general related to financial crime compliance, but also more specifically in terms of uh, KYC. This is also the reason why we started two years ago by building out our SWIFT KYC registry to help the industry ad address some of the challenges. Challenges which were mostly around uh, the, the bilateral document exchange when it comes down to uh, interacting with your correspondent and getting access to the, to the information. Um, also linked to the fact that most of you and many of you are already relying on external providers of data, which are also imposing uh, the associated costs. And actually all of us trying to add more uh, workforce and more people and intensifying the kind of research that you do uh, to avoid the threat of the de-risking, which is playing on both sides. Large financial institutions who basically consider that they cannot take the risk anymore and that they rather choose to terminate correspondent banking relationships. Small banks on the other side who are suffering from that and who basically need to find a way to demonstrate better compliance and transparency towards the financial industry. So which is also explaining the unequal process in between large to small and small to uh, large. And this is basically a bit the context setting for today. And also one of the, the, the big arguments why uh, we, SWIFT, together with the industry, we started to look at building out the solutions. Um, enough talking from my side at this stage. What I would now like to do is pass the word to Holly Johnson Stern, who you. will give her first perspective. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you. And what I'd like to start, do I change the slides? Okay, thanks. What I'd like to start with is just a bit of a level setting. Um, people who know me know I'm a kind of practical, literal person. And I'm also an extreme advocate of the SWIFT KYC registry, but I also like to manage expectations. And that is that absolutely no industry utility will take over the full exchange of KYC information. However, a good utility like SWIFT is going to be able to help you automate and streamline 70 to 80% 80, 80 of what's required to perform a KYC on one of your clients, okay? Now, when I took on this role um, in the summer of, of this year, it was to run the, the KYC on JPM program. What that means is we're looking at this as you know, there are a lot of banks in here for which we're very grateful for your business that you're doing with us, as well as the agents. And you know, we've done a lot of KYC on our clients, and we appreciate that. And we want to make sure we can respond to requests for KYC in a very thorough, professional way. So the approach that we're looking to for the SWIFT KYC registry is responding to requests for KYC on JP Morgan through the SWIFT KYC registry, okay? Now, when I took on the project, um, it was just a system and figure it out. The first thing that I did in my it, building this program was to create a governance because we didn't have a governance team that looked at KYC on JP Morgan. Um, that governance team is critical for our success and it is important because it has to well, I'm, I'm based in one line of business at J.P. Morgan in the, the CIB, Corporate Investment Bank. When we're doing KYC at this level, it's at a corporate level. And so on our governance team, we have members from our 
wholesale client onboarding, which are the group that perform our KYC on clients. We have legal, we have our network management, our global financial crimes and compliance, and one of my key partners, I don't know if she's here, Pat Giagrande, um, who has really enabled us to have a successful launch where we just launched the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank in a profile on the BIC registry just last week. Um, and then Office of the Secretary is a critical partner in this process. And the next thing that I did is create certain work streams, and, and I try to keep things simple. What are the procedures that we need? How are we going to get the content on the registry? What's our communication going to be? What's the permissioning? How are we going to provide this data? And last, we'll be consuming. Once we've got all the content on there, how will we consume this data? The next thing that was important to me is making it sustainable and institutionalizing this process. Instead of having me sit there and complete all of the baselines by myself, I wanted to find a way to make this an ongoing living thing. I, I kind of run a theory of, if I'm run over by a bus, can we still do KYC on JPM? So what I did is I, I worked this into our wholesale client onboarding group, who was doing the KYC for our financial institutions, and they're flipping it around and providing content into the registry as we speak and as I'm having the luxury of standing here and talking to you about the registry. So why the SWIFT KYC registry? Really two key things. Whenever we do anything at JP Morgan, the starting point that we have is our clients. We consider them first. Where are the clients? What are they doing? And as we saw in one of the first questions, there are a lot of banks in here, and clearly we're all connected to SWIFT, right? So that's the one thing that we decided this was the logical starting point for this program. And we are very thankful for the business that you give us. And we're also very thankful for the agents um, for helping us reach our global needs for our clients. And because of that, we need to make sure we respond to your requests for KYC on JP Morgan in a professional way, which leads me to the second point. And that is, um, Jamie Dimon has a, a fundamental thought in how we do business, and that is first-class business in a first-class way. And I think that the answer to both of those questions, where are our clients and who's doing things first-class business in a first-class way, led us to select the SWIFT KYC registry as our launching point for KYC on J.P. Morgan. Now, I've got some tactical points that I think are interesting, especially in comparison to some of the other utilities that make it easier to launch this with SWIFT KYC registry, you're already connected. Um, I was amazed. There's another utility we work with, uh, Clarion. It's, it's public um, information. And that's a significant technology investment. It's a separate installation. It's a separate system. SWIFT KYC registry is just another application on SWIFT.com. Easy to move forward with. Second, it's built by banks for banks. What was fascinating is when I found the partner to help us get, JP Morgan has 91 BICs, 91 entities in 41 countries, 41 countries. And the amount of time that I needed to train and that SWIFT worked with me to train the K our utility group in Chicago was minimal because it was so intuitive to how they already perform KYC. And clearly, strong service and support. Um, you can't match what SWIFT provides. And also, there's another small element. It's public collect. Some of the utilities charge for this service. SWIFT provides it for free as a part of their value-added service. And again, SWIFT is looking at this not as a standalone commercial profit-making concern, but as a solution to solve our problems of how we exchange KYC. So for me, in summary, we go where our clients go. We do business, first-class business in a first-class way. And both the answer to both of those questions led us to select SWIFT. And I have to say, I'm corporate by my professional background previous to this job. I was a corporate treasurer. I was a commercial banker. I was a treasury service sales manager. And I kind of wondered, why do all those guys go to FIG? 
And now I know, because I have to say, this is the best conference I've ever attended. It's my first SWIFT conference, and it's first class, in a first class way, and that's why SWIFT. Thanks. And Mark will talk about the experiences of Lloyd's. Should we just press stay? I didn't press anything. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Holly. So, um, my name is Mark Brotherton. I've been asked to explain why Lloyds Bank, one of the top 20 banks in the world, is so keen uh, and open about our support for the SWIFT registry. You'll see in the, um, the brochure stand uh, towards the back of the room, um, we've gone very public in terms of our support. And I'd like to spend a couple of minutes explaining why. And really, just to endorse some of the comments that Holly's made, but I'm very keen not to duplicate those comments. Okay, so I've just picked up five bullet points. Um, one point to make is that um, the role of chief operating officer means many things for different organizations. I, I sit in the front office, so I sit with the relationship teams. I'm part of the front office, and I'm the accountable executive for the SWIFT registry within Lloyd's Banking Group. And I think it's, I'm very delighted to be involved in the, the working group, but I think it's important that it's very clear who is responsible, who's the accountable executive. That's not just the case for the SWIFT working group, that's kind of everything that we do in business. But what we found is that before um, I got involved, it wasn't clear who the owner was. There was compliance, there was payments, uh, IT, there were many people involved, but nobody was driving it enough. There's a capacity issue within all organizations, whether you're a bank, a broker dealer, or obviously there's other companies in the room. And to me, unless somebody is driving it, and wants to do it, this enough, it will not happen. As I say, just, just like many other projects. So that would be the fundamental message, I think, that I've certainly learned, and one of the reasons I put my hand up to, uh, to drive this. Um, you'll see some of the points here. Um, we see benefits um, across regional and global banks. Uh, those of you that know, know the Lloyds banking model, although we are very much uh, UK focused, we have 15 million customers in the UK. We have a footprint that has reduced globally, but we are hugely um, reliant upon our correspondent banking um, colleagues for our clients to be able to move money around the world. And therefore, um, you know, the, just one of the reasons, I suppose, why the SWIFT registry is so important. Um, the time and cost efficiency piece is obvious. You'll see in the article that I've published, and I think there's going to be a video on the, um, the, the website as well, the SWIFT website. Um, that it's not just the amount of time, the administrative time, it's the time that senior management and our execs are spending discussing correspondent banking. To really work out the true cost of this is very difficult. Um, we put all our correspondence through uh, enhanced due diligence this year. We've completed it and we feel very comfortable. But during that period, which was a, a project that I led, there were some quite difficult conversations in fairness with, uh, with some of our senior people, indeed some of the board members of, of the group. But we're, you know, that's behind us now. Um, creating capacity is interesting. Probably most um, people in the room are looking at how we can engage colleagues more, um, you know, making your organizations the best organization to work for. Well, we don't want our compliance colleagues, whether they're junior colleagues or senior colleagues, spending their time, or indeed operational colleagues. We don't want them spending their time chasing other banks and chasing questionnaires. We want them to enjoy coming into work and doing the things that their professional qualifications have helped them to do. So we think this is a great opportunity to improve the, the staff and colleague engagement within the business. Um, the fourth one is an obvious one. Working, uh, I've been in a number of sessions over the last couple of days. Um, collaboration is a word that's come out, I think, in almost every session. Um, and not least, this is an opportunity for all organizations to work uh, towards, obviously, fighting the, the threat of financial crime. And a final point, which is exceptionally important to us, we are aware of other utilities. But from our perspective, the confidence and trust that we have in SWIFT um, is a huge enabler and certainly helps me personally. When I go about to speak to more senior people than me in the business to try to understand why we have endorsed something of this nature that is such an important issue, both from a data security issue, with the regulator discussions, then when I mention SWIFT, then I get people being much more comfortable and open to a discussion. So they're my five bullet points. I'm sure there's many others, but I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. It's always lovely to come on to uh, that type of um, uh, recommendation. Thank you.
So what I want to do is really share with you a little bit around the KYC registry, what it does, the journey I think we've taken so far, uh, and really the why. Why join SWIFT? Why register your data? Why use the utility next year to share your data? So what is the KYC registry? In brief, it's a single source of validated, comprehensive KYC data, which has been set, built, and constructed with the aid of our initial working group banks of 12, um, which has now been expanded to include banks like Lloyd's, Unicredit, Clearstream, Danska, and Asia Development Bank. There are five key principles behind the KYC registry. One, it's a standardized set of data and documents covering the core elements of your KYC processes, both the customer identification, the group structure and ownership, the core revenues um, and client breakdown, as well as products and services offered. Um, of course, a comprehensive AML section. And then last but not least, the tax area, or FATCA, to those in the know. All of which have been evidenced and validated um, by teams of ex-compliance professionals and legal research analysts to a clear and transparent methodology. This is all housed in a secure, hosted, um, uh, online data set, including workflow tools, including versioning, as well as a full and transparent audit trail of all incoming and outgoing activities. And then, of course, last but not least, the fact that we are focused on some of the hard to get, um, what we see as critical content and data. This includes ultimate beneficial ownership information. We also include data like the SWIFT traffic profile, addressing one of the newest concerns that you have as correspondent banks, that of KYCC, or know your correspondence, correspondence. Um, so to that first element, a KYC standard you can adopt. One of the areas that Bart touched on very briefly, and something that I've heard from many of the conversations I've already had with uh, people like yourselves at Cybos, has been around the differences in standards, both by country, both from a larger to a small to mid-sized uh, bank, as well as the differences in process, be it a CDD or an enhanced due diligence process. There is a clear standard here you can adopt with 100 mandatory data points, evidenced by 30 elements, uh, 30 different documents that evidence that data, covering, as I've kind of already touched upon, um, the core elements of your KYC process. The SWIFT traffic profile. Now, this is something that we're extremely excited about and has really been developed in cooperation with some of the larger US um, dollar clearing houses in particular. And what we will do is provide you an aggregate view of incoming and outgoing uh, payments and trade finance messages out of your individual BIC8 in an aggregate view. So you can see, as you can see with these little blue circles, at uh, three levels of detail, the numbers of messages as a proportion of your total traffic that have either originated or completed their journeys in sanctioned or FATF high-risk countries. We will be able to provide you with an external independent benchmark to be able to demonstrate once and for all true clarity and true network cleanliness when engaging with your correspondence. With three levels of detail going down to the individual correspondent through which you have um, some degree of exposure. Uh, this is something that you can only order on your own institution, but literally, I believe, is one of SWIFT's big bets in terms of what will be coming up next. Now, in terms of where we are, we've talked a great deal, uh, and I know you've heard in the press and the various Cybos um, uh, news releases around the KYC registry. Let's talk hard numbers. So we launched at the back end of December, and we already have over 1,470 banks signed up and contributing data in across 176 countries, and we've accomplished that in just nine months. Uh, we have support from development banks, Asia Development Bank, African Development Bank, and the IDB in uh, Southern America, as well as core support from some of the central banks. I think one of the messages earlier on was around the importance of regulator engagement, and that's something we've taken extremely seriously. So why choose the KYC registry? This is validated data that you can trust clearly time and date stamped and checked and cross-checked by professionals. 
It's a large bank standard that we're looking to sit and evangelize and have adopted regardless of where you are banking in the world, be it here in Asia or back over in London or over in the States uh, uh, such as Holly. It's clear unit pricing. You pay for the data you need. It's a secured, safe data storage where you, as the content owner, always control access to who can see this data through either approving or rejecting that data request. And more importantly, I think, as you heard from Mark, we have the unique and the hard-to-get data so that the relationship managers in the room are not being used as data collection um, agents, rather that the time is spent on building relationships, building business, and validating and making risk decisions if you're in the back office. Bart. All right. Thank you, Guy. We need the boards. Yes. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Mark. Um, the only thing that I want to mention, what is always annoying when you attend conferences is that in order to get everything prepared, our communications teams, they also get, ask us to get the materials way ahead in advance, which was shown again on the adoption slide, because we are in such a luxury situation that our adoption numbers are uh, increasing and evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. So guys spoke about 1,470 entities. I did a check yesterday evening, and we're actually at 1,570 five entities as well. So you see, we still have uh, definitely a very strong momentum, a definitely strong pace. So with that, let's try to go for a bit more of a collaborative and a joyful way of continuing this session. So we had the experience sharing of our, of our panelists. So what would now be really great is to also get a bit of an experience sharing from your side. How are we going to do this? Well, we basically are going to play a little game know your audience. So, Mark, yep. Holly, Thank you. Guy, Thanks, Bob. so they each get a whiteboard. I'll ask a number of questions, multiple choice related questions, and before you as the audience, you can vote your responses. We will ask Mark, Holly, and Guy to provide and to predict what will be the two most popular answers to provide. After that, we will open the digivote, and then it will be up to you to give your opinion, and we will basically see where we get. We are here accompanied by Ms. Stacey Parson, who will take the score. One good answer of the, of the participants is one point. If they get all of the two points, the two answers right, they get five points. So it will be very distinctive. So let's shoot for the first question. So let me first read it for you. We don't open the <laughs> voting yet. Which of the following best practices, the, uh, which of the following best describes your current experience? One, third party information is expensive and can be incomplete or contradictory to other sources. Two, FI KYC information exchange is unequal. I'm asked for more information than I receive from my larger correspondence. Three, I have difficulty collecting and analyzing counterparty information in a short time frame. Four, I don't always receive requested information in a language format I can understand. And five, I'm repeatedly asked for different versions of the same core KYC information by multiple correspondents. So Mark, Holly, Guy, take your votes. Five and two, Holly. Um. Yeah, Two no cheating. Sort of five. Two answers, Holly. You need to I know, but I'm, I'm just going on record. <laughs> so what, what is that? Two, two and one? Two and one. Okay. And guy, two and two five. And five yeah. All right. Please open the voting. Now it's up to you. Pick your vote. Please pick one. I am repeatedly asked for different versions of the same core KYC information by multiple correspondents. Number five. Who had number five of you guys? Yine. Yine. <laughs> That's already one. And the second largest. Oh, there we have an equal one. Third party information is expensive, can be incomplete, or I have difficulty collecting and analyzing the counterparty information. Anyone had one or three? Oh, I had one. One. I think Holly Johnson Stores answers are, are changing by the second. <laughs> I erased them. No, you have the score, Stacey? <laughs> so Mark has one point. Holly has. What's happening over here? <laughs> I have 1.5, really. But one I'll, point. I'll take one. one point. Guy has one point as well. <laughs> I think what's important here is that to, to just reflect on that one, repeatedly ask for different versions 
of the same core KYC information by multiple correspondents. This is exactly what we try to do with our registry. Get rid of the redundancy, the replication of the information exchanges. Have a central utility where you put and store the information only once. We will validate that, and from there, basically, all of your correspondents can get access to that information at the time that they want, and it's a single version of information which applies across all of the institutions. Ready for our second question? Yes. Yep. The KYC registry focuses on correspondent banks and funds distributors. Which additional entity types would be most valuable to you? Asset management firms? Trusts, corporates, broker dealers, non SWIFT connected banks, and funds. And of course, we perfectly acknowledge KYC is broader than just the correspondent banking space. We would like to hear from you in which other areas within your institutions do you struggle most from that? Holly? Three and four, only two. Corporates and broker dealers. Guy, corporates, non SWIFT connected banks asset management firms, and corporates. Okay. Please open the voting. Corporates, Woo. huge, 46%. That's a hit for all of you, that's already good. Second one, the non-SWIFT connected banks, 16%. So I think there we have someone who just managed to get five points, which is Guy. <laughs> and with only two answers. Sorry? And with only two answers. And with only two answers. And Holly and Mark, they both have <laughs> one point. Okay, so there we have someone who's taking the lead. Uh, perhaps, Guy, do you want to do you wanna share your views on that in terms of the conversations that we've had with banks as well and, and sure. what their take is on that? I think, um, particularly with corporates, it's an area that Swift is currently exploring. We have a um, big four consulting uh, partner helping us uh, understand and research that space. But a genuine challenge is how we build a single baseline, a single reservoir of content that would be applicable for the different corporates, even by vertical. And the non-Swift connected banks is something that we already, um, uh, we already sell to and enjoy relationships with non-SWIFT connected banks. Uh, and they will be in target, in scope, extremely shortly. Holly, from your perspective, challenges around corporate KYC, is that similar, comparable with correspondent banking? Is that? Uh, certainly. I mean, we've got a number of different corporate types that we're working on in our, in our own KYC initiatives. And it's... I think the thing that I took away from the user group session, and it's, it's a lesson we sort of learned, the banks and the community of SWIFT have to get our information on the system first. Because what makes a utility truly functional and, and purposeful is when it can be consumed. And to do that, you've got to have content. Mm. And getting, and there, the, the, the phrase I came up with, and people I think agreed, the first is the worst. And so the point is that the, the user groups walked away with a commitment to get our own information onto the registry. And we're professionals. We do this for a living. And it's difficult for us. The challenge when you look at the corporates is to get them onto the registry, I think, would also be equally challenging. All right. Thank but you. But important. Very good. The first is the worst. Guy, as you're yes. in the lead. <laughs> Third question. What data and documents do you find the most challenging to collect from your correspondents? FATCA information, W8. The UBO declaration and the supporting information. Third, board member director declaration supporting ID documents. Fourth, everything related to AML and AML documentation, policies, procedures, AML questionnaires, Wolfsburg. And last, corporate governance information. So annual reports, statutes, Ready? Uh, yeah. All right. Number two, number three, number two, number four, number two, number three. Well, there is some consistency in terms of the UBO, <laughs> which is good. Open the voting, please.
UBO information, slightly that was to be expected, 46%. And then the other piece, which is the board member or director declaration supporting ID documents. So uh, looking at that, Mark, I think you have a full hit. Absolutely. That is five points for Mark. Holly, one point. And Guy, five points. Stays in the lead. Mark, what's your, uh, what's your take on this? Is, is it really such a challenge? And, and what is the main challenge around collecting or requesting this information? I think, I think there's a, a wider point, Bart. So I had the pleasure of sitting with um, 15 other banks. And you saw the list of banks uh, on the earlier slide. At Swift were kind enough to host uh, a two-day working shop in Brussels in uh, Belgium a couple of weeks ago. And listening, you know, this is a closed group, so listening to the expectations of those banks in terms of the type of questions aligned to their risk appetite was fascinating. So um, I'm certainly you know, in the middle of um, Lloyds Banking Group's compliance regime, and to be honest, it's pretty demanding. But then when you sit down and you look at all the other banks, you can see that there is a core level of consistency, and then there's a number of other questions which actually are important to that organization, but we're challenging each other to say, because you know, is it really important? Is it a nice to have or important? Because we cannot put every single element on the registry that fits with every single questionnaire that goes out globally. So it's a fantastic discussion to work out what are the core questions, and I think to pick up the uh, ultimate beneficiary, of course that's a core issue. So it's not surprise it's number one. But I think the more interesting thing to me are those questions that, that we're quite open with each other, that our organizations expect through the risk appetite, but actually do we really need it? And that's going to be the key element, and I believe that will make this a success, but we do need to work together on it. And we don't just need to work with these 16 banks, we need to work with all banks. It's just that these banks have volunteered initially to, 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 to drive it. All right, thank you. Let's see, next question. I don't think it is a... There is one more slide, one more question. It's not really a digi-voting question. These are more kind of true or false statements that have been covered throughout the presentation today. So the idea is basically to not do the voting, but just raise your hands whether you believe something is true or false. And then, of course, we'll also see whether our audience here can collect individual points. So the first one, the KYC registry has 1,000 registered banks in 100 countries. Those of you who think this is false, please raise hands. What do you think, guys? Yes. False, false, false. Raise again the hands. False. Who said false? We have many more. We, spoke, we just spoke about 1,500, 1,570 something. So we have a coverage in 174 countries since the beginning, since we launched the registry. Uh, and indeed, 1,500, more than 1,500 across 600 financial institutions have registered. Second one, KYC registry is priced as a per user subscription regardless of the amount of usage. Those who believe that this is true, raise hands. Just a few hands. Guy, you want to comment on that? Or let's see, false, false, false. Why is this false, Guy? Because it's paid, uh, the way that the KYC registry works is you pay a per unit fee only for the data you require. So it's only for the data that you require, and it also allows you to share the information internally within your institution. So bar, uh, banks such as JP Morgan Lloyds that have multiple entities, what they basically do, they request access to counterparty information, but they can also disseminate the information within their organization so that they can do all of the KYC for that entity in their institution. The KYC registry data includes ultimate beneficial owners and shareholders down to 10%. Those who think this is true, please raise hands. Oh, Albert, that is one answer. True, true, true. Exactly. So this is something that we discussed uh, when we set up the working group. Uh, and we spoke about, well, if we want to cover the UBO information into the registry, what is the threshold that we need to take into consideration. At the time that we, that we started the initiative, which was two years ago, most of the institutions were looking at a 20 to 25% threshold. 
And actually, we decided as a working group collectively to lower the threshold up to 10%. So that basically means that KYC information that you will find back, you will find that for 10%. Well, the UBO information, at least, you will find that for 10% and above. Registering your data in the KYC registry means that any other user can see and access it. Those who think this is a true statement, please raise your hands. Few, most of you think it's false. It is indeed false. So what we have been very clear about is that the KYC registry is not a public data source where you can find all of the information, but it is a data source where we kept the principle of user provided and user controlled. So banks contribute their own K institutional KYC information, but they also have full control on who gets access to this information. Perhaps, Holly or Mark, do you, do you want to comment on that? Why has that been such an important uh, principle? I think from our standpoint, it, it, it's a governance, uh, it was a governance requirement that, that we can control releasing that because we want to know who's getting it, why. We want to understand what is the relationship that we have with the bank. So we need to be able to have a time to review that and then consider our response in allowing, and more often than not, we'll allow, but it allows us a chance to, to validate the relationship that we have with that bank. All right. Fifth one, the KYC registry allows users to communicate directly with one another. Request a translation. Is this true? Raise your hands. So the idea there, it is all very true. So what we basically wanted to do is to make sure that people who use the KYC registry, they can use the platform as well to, to get into conversation, to communicate with one another, so that you don't have to fall back to the traditional channels of emails, telephone, uh, etc. But at least you have the information available. If you see or if you want a kind of a translation for a document or if you want a clarification, it is a platform that has underlying workflows and mechanisms that allows you to communicate with one another. The registry data standards and requirements are very differently set up from country to country. Those of you who think that is true, that we did define different standards, please raise your hands. I think that is a clear one, exactly. So I think the, the, the beauty of, of what we've been able to accomplish with this working group is that we came to an agreement to put in place one standardized baseline for correspondent banking. A baseline which is not in all cases fulfilling, let's say, the 100% of the needs that you have, but at least it is providing you already a vast amount of the standard KYC and EDD data that you need for your correspondence. And of course, as the registry grows, we also continue having the conversations with the banks to evolve the baseline. And final one, SWIFT will charge you to list your own information even if you do not require another bank's data. Is this a true statement? Please raise your hand. You all disagree. Everyone is disagreeing, which is totally true. What is important for us as SWIFT, we, we are a cooperative. The, the idea that we have the ambition with our financial crime compliance roadmap is to really bring benefits to the financial industry. Um, in that sense, any type of data contribution, uploading and providing your own institutional data is a service which is free of charge. Also in 2015, we've made it very clear, we encourage all of you just to sign up to get familiar and acquainted with the platform, and in that sense, there is also no charges for any type of data consumption that you would envisage. So with that, we come to the end of our quiz. Stacy, do we have a winner? Uh, yep, yeah. uh, Guy, you win with 11 <laughs> points. I guess that's a, that's a good thing you should know some of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Mark, second place with seven, and Holly, sorry, four. Excellent. That's All right. But still, congratulations to you. I kindly invite you later today to our Compliance Forum cocktail. <laughs> and so I invite all of you to that one as well. We have 35 seconds remaining, which leaves perhaps room for one question. And there is one gentleman in the back. And then, of course, for those of you who still have additional questions, please come and see us at the SWIFT stand. We're there with a the full team as well. You're also invited to the Compliance Forum. The last question. Okay. Uh, Dennis Knebel from Sydberg in Denmark. 
Uh, I have a question for Mark and Harley. If I may challenge you, um, do you believe or can you imagine that uh, JP Morgan or Lloyd Banks came out and informed that if you want to do or continue business with us, you need to be registered in the registry, uh, in the KYC registry? Um, good question. I have to be honest, it's not something we've considered at all. So uh, um, I think it would be unreasonable at this stage, um, and certainly to, to insist on a certain registry being used. What I would say, though, is that um, the, I think there'll be a decision that's made collaboratively. I don't think an individual organization would make it, to be honest. We, if you look at the Lloyds model, where we were um, in about 30 countries in terms of footprint, we're now down to six. You, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, the importance we have on the correspondent banking network is, I know all banks are important, but for Lloyds it's exceptionally important. And I think we want to work with those correspondents as opposed to sort of insisting that uh, the conditions in place. What we would say though is we have contacted all our correspondents and advised them that we are supportive of the, um, the Swift KYC registry. So I think there's a difference in being supportive and insisting, I think there's a huge difference between the two. But you know, the, the more of our correspondents that use the registry, the better. Hence, we, we have, um, you know, with Swift's endorsement, we've actually um, written out to them. But I think that's different than insisting. I don't know if that answers the question. If not, please come up and, and ask me the question later. Holly? Again, uh, we, we place the client first um, and the agent first. We, we can't mandate that. And, and our model for the utilities is we need to go where our clients are. And um, so I can't imagine that we would mandate. Um, I think we would strongly encourage that we're efficient in how we're exchanging static data and encourage the use of a utility to exchange that so that we can let our professionals work on the more higher value end questioning that makes a comprehensive KYC assessment. So uh, I can't imagine we'd mandate, strongly encourage perhaps, but we have to respond to what our clients need. All right, uh, conscious of time, we reached the end of the session. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for the massive attendance. Uh, I hope it was a useful, interesting session. To the earlier point in terms of what SWIFT is doing these days around financial crime compliance, there are two other auditorium sessions which are taking place tomorrow. One is around sanctions, sanction screening, sanctions testing, and the other one is what we do in the area of AML and analytics. And then, of course, aside of that, uh, today at 5 p.m., you're kindly invited to attend the Compliance Forum cocktail, which is taking uh, place on the Level 5 area next to the Cybos TV area. And so that is today at 5 p.m. So with that, again, Holly, Mark, Guy, thank you very much for the attendance, and have a nice day. Thank you.